Good evening and welcome to tonight's virtual launch of Kenyon Review's March-April issue, which is packed with beautiful work written by brilliant contributors, four of whom we will feature tonight. Layla Shati, Jared Jackson, Willis C. Richards, and Ryan Stevenson. I am Elizabeth Dark, Associate Director of Programs for the KR, and we are delighted to have you with us this evening. Uh, Christina Carrera and Elliot Holt will be helping me in a moment, but first I will attend to a couple of details to help guide you through your time with us. If you would like to access closed captioning for this evening, you may do so by clicking on the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen. And if at any point you experience technical difficulties, our Kenyan Review Associate Ocean Way is keeping an eye on the chat and is ready to assist you if you want to private message, message them there. Uh, and they will also be posting helpful links in the chat throughout the evening, so keep your eye on the chat. The chat will remain open during the reading for encouraging comments. And following the reading, we will take some questions from you, which you can ask in the chat or uh, if you'd like to uh, unmute yourself when you're called upon, um, we can take it that way as well. As an audience member, you are welcome to keep your camera on during the reading or turn it off. Uh, please do, however, keep yourself muted. Uh, and I think that's all I have. I'm helped this evening by Elliot Holt, our deputy editor, and Christina, Christina Carrera, who is our 2021-2023 fellow in poetry. And Elliot is gonna start with an introduction to the evening. It would help if I muted, unmuted myself. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, on behalf of our editor, Nicole Therese Dutton, who um, is uh, here, but a little bit under the weather, I just wanna welcome you all. Thank you for joining us. This is a virtual launch of, as Elizabeth said, the March-April issue. But for those of you who don't know, the March-April issue, which I'm holding up here, it's beautiful cover art by Steve Locke, is an issue um, dedicated to work in all its forms. Um, you know emotional, physical, intellectual, you'll find fiction and poetry and essays about jobs and labor and also, um, you know, other kinds of work, emotional work, etc. Um, we're really excited about this issue. We're really thrilled to have four contributors to the issue with us tonight. But I do hope that if you aren't yet a subscriber that you will um, order a copy of the issue print or digital. The link is in the chat. We'll add it again. Um, it was really a thrill to uh, for us to choose work for this issue because when we put out the call for submissions we got so many submissions over 1400 people submitted specifically to be considered for the work issue which suggests a lot of people have a lot of things to say about work so thank you all for being here and i'm going to turn it over to christina to introduce our first reader thanks elliot i'm so pleased to be able to introduce um Leila chati um we're really happy to have her work in the issue and it was lovely to read her submission. Um, it's, it's a wonderful behind the scenes thing that gets to happen. We get to see all of these works before they, they are released and it's just a beautiful experience. So um, Leila Chati is a Tunisian American poet and author of Deluge uh, coming out or came out, sorry, from Copper Canyon Press in 2020 winner of the Levis Reading Prize and long listed for the Penn Open Book Award and multiple chapbooks. Her honors include a Pushcart Prize, grants from the Barbara Deming Memorial Fund and the Helen Berlitzer Foundation and fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, the Wisconsin Institute for Creative Writing and Cleveland State University. Her poems appear in the New York Times Magazine, The Nation, the Atlantic and Poetry, and now can you review? And she currently teaches at the University of Wisconsin Madison. Please welcome her. Hi, thank you for that, Christina. That was so lovely. And uh, hi, everyone. I am um, zooming you from uh, from a hotel room, so <laughs> hence the the background. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Um, I'm thinking about work. Thinking about work a lot. Um, I'm going to start by reading a poem off my phone, which I don't usually do, but uh, I do not have the printed copy with me. So we're just, we're making it work. Um, and then I have uh, printed ones, um, but I'm so excited. I love the Kenyon Review. Kenyon Review is always my, my dream um, publication when I was a student. So this is very exciting for me. Um, 
to be here with you all virtually. Okay, the first poem I'm going to read is called Trying. When I see the article about the polar bears wandering into Russian homes, I leave it open unread for a week and consider this trying. Because I am trying, to be honest, I can't say I'm doing my best or even trying my best, but at the very least, at my very worst, I'm trying. I wake up and this is trying, by which I mean I am sad and yet participate in the requisite functions of my life, usually without audible complaint or demonstrative suffering, trying for others' benefit to be polite or trying to be honest because I am embarrassed to be suffering. But I also mean this, that I'm sad and it is difficult, a trial, a circumstance that tries my patience. The sadness is so annoying. I'm so sad it drives me crazy. Like everyone else, I try to do the dishes, to remember birthdays, not to pick at my degenerate skin. Because I am female, I try to fulfill domestic labors, like cleaning out the fridge and unreciprocated kindness. I try to improve my appearance without making it evident I care about my appearance. I try to care about the right things while making it clear I'm still trying with my appearance so that men might consider fucking me. And I should consider this privately the measure of my worth. And because I am American, I try to keep up with the crisis de l'heure with domestic politics and public displays of rage. I try to be productive. I try to remember reusable bags for my produce, to reduce my footprint, to check pronouns and my privilege. I try to do my part, to cause little harm, but because I am alive, harm comes with the territory. The territory upon which I rent is stolen, the city gentrified, and all year an unseasonable heat that I, minor accomplice, have to try very hard not to delight in. Short sleeves in February, sweating through Halloween. I admit it, for no defensible reason, I still eat meat, still drive on occasion to the CBS down the street. I've been known to tell a joke that verges on mean. I'm trying, I mean it, to be good, to be good in a way that is not covertly gendered or self-serving, to be accountable, to practice virtue without announcement, to make at least half as good what I leave is how I found it. Trying for you, ink blot, mirage, standing in the artificial dawn on cold tile, golden dew on a stick, first snow, pawing at the window to get in. I'm gonna switch to Kenyan poems. The first one's called The Reversal. A man who tries very hard to love me convinces me to leave for the first time in days, my bed, to go outside, to see the frozen lake. And despite the grandeur of the vast white field and the novelty of boys walking across it like novice deities, I am most interested in the geese. Look at them sleeping, I say, nodding to where they rest in a line along the edge of the ice where the ice is turning back into water in imperceptible degrees, the heady blue encroaching. And I, still addled by grief, still immoderately exhausted by being alive, consider who knows why my mind does anything it does, how the world could be flipped. Blue lake or blue sky, birds and feathered hunks of ice-like clouds. And I think then, naturally, of myself in this reversal, standing suddenly atop the firmament, one of heaven's citizens, perhaps now an angel, perhaps someone waiting in the long queue to be seen. And I consider what this would mean for me, my options. Once someone who loved me fiercely, fiercely said, the dead have no options, Layla, they're dead. And the angels do nothing but God's will loitering in the interminable meantime, useless as pigeons. Here, the geese sleep at the edge of the thaw, unbothered, and winter in the boys forge ahead. And the man goes on loving me in the periphery, 
So I write the earth. I stay there as long as I can bear, looking at it. This next poem is called um, Prelapse Arian, uh, which is before the fall of man. Before the rest of it, there was Adam and me, two oldest kids on the cul-de-sac on the outskirts of our Michigan town, where nothing ever happened except our lives. We were just beginning to begin, pre-pre-adolescent, naive and happy as the first man and woman who didn't yet know what they were. I was so young, I'd still not come to think of myself as anything inherently bad or good. I hardly understood myself as a self. I was like an animal before they were named. Our world was small as his grandmother's voice could reach. So we spent those years circling sidewalks on bikes, looking at everything twice and then again closely. We were unashamed of our interest, picking up stones to inspect their damp undersides tramping through yards to peek into neighbors' low windows. So when we first saw it, on the hood of the car, conjoined bodies of one roly-poly mounting another, we observed with the easy curiosity of one witnessing a foreign custom of which they possess no pre-notion or expectation to join. And when, later that summer, in the den with the door closed, Adam showed me again, this time human, on the screen glistening in the stark light like my idea of the divine, I wasn't afraid. I thought not about skin or shame or sin. I was consumed with the looking, not excited, not repulsed. I was looking only to know and knew only what could be seen, a man and a woman, their bodies moving, the camera moving up their bodies, their faces revealing something I couldn't read. And I couldn't know what would come. Didn't know yet the corporeal meanings of pleasure and yearning and harm. Couldn't conceive there was possible a hunger that wouldn't satisfy, a lover that couldn't love me, a self I shouldn't be. I neither hated nor loved myself. I couldn't imagine anyone hating or loving me and how much I would hate to be loved and want who I hated. I didn't understand my body would hold power and would have power held over it. I had never starved for a man or bled for a man or said yes for a man when I didn't want to. I didn't think about men at all. I knew only my father and what I assumed were other people's fathers, boys who were boys and not monsters. And I stood looking until I thought I'd seen everything. There with Adam, our faces lit as if with the secret knowledge of our future suffering and bliss, a knowledge we didn't know not to look for, but nothing happened, not for a long time. We turned it off and went outside. And I'm gonna finish with another uh, Midwestern poem um, about a strip mall from my hometown. And that strip mall is called Eastwood, and so is this poem. Because it's June and there's nothing to do, we go to the strip mall at the edge of town. Someone's mother drives us. It isn't mine. These girls, they've got hair blaring red as a siren, no curfews, boyfriends and rumors of going all the way. I'm 14 and buttoned up in a blouse Bespectacled, a little shy, but last summer I tried to die, which makes me interesting. We loiter in the moist heat of the parking lot, calling lewd things to strangers across the relucent sea of asphalt, laughing with our whole mouths. Every part of us gleams. Our licked fingers sticky from free Krispy Kremes, our lips glossed, cheap cherry. We're not that beautiful, but we're young, which to men, we're old enough to know is close. We stare them down, perched on the curb. We bare our thighs like secrets, secrets that have hurt us. Sitting there, impatient, one girl might kiss suddenly another, giggling, shadows merging on the pitted sidewalk, 
eyes open to see if they're seen. And at the very least, there's me, ever the apprentice in tenderness and nerve. When a man eventually, inevitably approaches, we rise as birds do, all at once, flushed and shrieking until we regroup out of reach, our bodies heaving against each other as if we have narrowly escaped a fate we know to fear, but can't name. Then we do it again, to be sure. When the sun swells before the sky's mantling like a rosy bubble, we wander snapping hubba bubba as the street lights pop on above us, proffer wishes and gossip like they're makeshift stars. We wait for someone to wonder where we are, find ourselves waiting long into the dark. I think we like this part best, the night falling over our shoulders like a borrowed sweatshirt, still warm, the blonde grasses whispering as we circle and circle the unclaimed lot, knowing that we could be forgotten, but are not. And if we listen hard before someone comes for us, some nights our names are called between guitar riffs and the classic rock station blaring from rusted cars in the bar patio across the street. Songs we know by heart. Songs our fathers once sang to our mothers before they were ours or anyone's. Ballads that made them believe it was possible they could, a lifetime, love, be loved, desperately, like that. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, that was beautiful. I have the pleasure of introducing our next reader, Jared Jackson. Jared was born in Hartford, Connecticut. He received an MFA in fiction from Columbia University where he was awarded a Chairs Fellowship and a Creative Writing Teaching Fellowship. His work has received support from the Tin House Winter Workshop and has appeared in the New York Times Book Review, the Yale Review, Guernica, and of course, the Kenyon Review in our current issue. Uh, he has been awarded fellowships from McDowell and Baldwin for the Arts and is a 2021-2022 uh, Center for Fiction Susan Camel Emerging Writer Fellow. Jackson works in literary programs at PEN America, and tonight he's going to read from the story that's in this issue, which is called Bebo. Hello, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. Um, reading with um, Layla and Willa and Ryan. Want to thank uh, Ocean and Christina and Elizabeth and Nicole who's under the weather and of course, Elliot. Um, this, uh, yeah, this short story, um, it's from a, a collection that I'm working on called Title Locals that basically follows teenagers and young adults from Hartford, Connecticut, which is where I'm from. Um, and this story would be the first story um, in the collection. Um, and I'm just gonna start from the beginning and read the couple of the first opening sections. So, Babo. Babo and I used to kick it, then we didn't. But the fact that we once did gave Ennis the idea. Practice had ended, and we were parked with our gear on the curb outside the Quickie Mart where Ennis's dad worked. Fall came quickly that year, gave Summer the boot without notice. By the time we made the 15 minute walk from the park, crossing the last practice field, the one with grass so thin, so patchy, it reminded us of our coach's balding head, and down to the corner store where the store sat, two buildings over from the Boys and Girls Club, across the street from the other convenience store, the one that gave Ennis's dad headaches because that one had a gas station and his didn't, which cut into the business. The son had almost clocked out for the day. Ain't that Ralphie? Ennis said, pointing with the metal baseball bat he stole from our coach's bag two weeks earlier. After swiping it, Ennis slipped a fiber from his dad's store register, rode his bike to the Walmart on Flatbush Avenue, bought a pack of red black bat grip, swapped out the black grip that was pilling from the one he stole and came to practice the next day like it wasn't a thing. When coach pressed him, referencing the missing bat and asking Ennis how he got his, daring him to lie, Ennis lifted it to coach's eyes. Does this look like the same bat to you? He said, holding it by the barrel, moving it left to right, taunting coach and flouting the brand new tape job. Yeah, that's him, I said, pushing down his bat with my hand. Ralphie and his boys were across the street, holding court in the parking lot of the competing convenience store. It's where they served the zombies who skulked around corners and down alleyways, where they had fast exchanges with cars that pulled up slow, where they leaned into the windows of those cars, touched fists, 
and may baggies disappear from one hand and reappear in another like magic. It was one of their usual spots, aside from the lot behind the pizza place where they set up shop on the weekends, which is five minutes north off of Henry Street, directly across from one of the dorms that live owned by the private college that existed in its own little bubble. That was where the white kids from the college who made up more than half of Ralphie's customers sleepwalk to for late night pizza. It was owned by this Greek guy who gave Ralphie and them scraps of whatever he had left over. Frostbite and mozzarella sticks, days old wings, the occasional salad tossed together with lettuce he was half a second away from trashing. Anything to make Ralphie and his boys handle their business away from the front entrance. You think he let me run with them? Ennis asked. Run with them. Join his crew, Ennis said, standing up and tossing the bat to me. I caught it, squeezed it. It was my first time holding the bat since Ennis lifted it. It was padded, felt stronger, made you feel like you had more control, something we all itched for. Why you want to do that? Why are you asking questions instead of giving answers? I rolled the bat over in my hands, dragged the barrel across the cracked concrete. We need the money, Ennis finally said. I glanced at Ralphie and his boys, looked back at Ennis. Probably not. Why not? Wouldn't trust you, I said, and Ennis knew what I meant. He was one of the few white boys in the neighborhood, looked like he'd been pulled straight from a Disney movie. You're dirty for that. You asked. Ennis ripped the bat from my hands and got into a stance, front shoulder tucked, backed elbow high, the bat at a 45 degree angle like a jacked up antenna. We were both 14 and I played on the same baseball team since he moved to the city two years earlier, since he seeped into my life like a gas leak. Ennis lived two doors down with his mom, who never left the apartment, and his pops, who hardly spent time in it. Moved here from Wisconsin by way of Bosnia. He told me the stories, which family members were killed during the war, how his mom and pops carried him through forests, trudged through rivers, the bodies he remembered, the detached limbs iced over like frozen meat. Hartford ain't shit, he once told me. We were throwing rocks over the fence in his backyard, which is nothing more than a patch of grass the size of a chalk outline for a game of Foursquare. We had nothing, less than nothing, and more to be afraid of. This place don't scare me, he said, and for whatever reason, I believed him. What about Babo? Ennis asked now. What about Babo? Keep up. Ennis extended the bat with both hands, measured the distance between the end of the barrel and my head. Ralphie's his brother, Babel can put in a good word. Shit, we'll make him put in a good word. We, yeah, we, Colin, Ennis said, swinging the bat so close I could lick it. Ain't Babel your boy? We will grab him after practice. I never claimed Babel as my boy, but we used to orbit each other. Our moms are friends, and they worked in the same plaza on Jordan Lane. Babel's mom bagged groceries at Stop and Shop while my mom peddled cheap sneakers at the Payless three stores down. They ate lunch together, rolled the bus to and from work together. And when they hung out outside of work, Babel and I did too, both of them dragging us along to their ladies' nights. I'm an only child, but my mom calls her best accident from her worst mistake. And though it ain't work out with my dad, who I haven't seen in years, but last I heard stay with his sister who lived no more than 15 minutes from mom and me, to this day, Mom will bring up how she regrets not giving me a sibling, how she's afraid of leaving me alone in the world. Point being, mom like that baby was my age. We were forced together. This is how it was until Ennis appeared, which was around the same time Babel's mom disappeared, sent to the retreat on Retreat Avenue. No one calls it that anymore, but when I heard Babel's mom had been committed, I looked it up. Learned it was one of the first hospitals of its kind. Learned the grounds were designed by the same guy who did Central Park. Learned that it went through a number of names before landing on the Institute of Living. A decent name, sure, but the retreat sounds better. Gives the illusion that you're only on vacation. With Babel's mom gone, I only saw him around the way, at school or practice or wandering alone, moving from corner to corner, street to street. He didn't seem to mind being alone. Once his mom left, he left in his own way too. He was never a talkative kid, but those days he hardly spoke when spoken to. Instead, he looked at you like how a dog looks at itself in a mirror, empty, without recognition, which spooked most kids. 
brought to mind the rumors about his mom, the whispers our teammates believe were true. I never saw the signs and I never asked mom about it, but there was always chatter about the voices Bay was mom was said to have heard in her head. How she was spotted walking down Jordan Lane onto the Berlin Turnpike and into, dark, into, and into the direction of oncoming traffic until a state trooper pulled her over. That she was the reason Bay would walk with the limp. That she injured him during one of her episodes. None of it was true and though I never added on, didn't talk shit about Bebo or his mom, I never stopped our teammates either. On the day Ennis decided we'd go to Bebo's apartment so he could have a word with Ralphie, we came up from behind Bebo after practice. Ennis had his stolen bat in his right hand and joked about Bebo's belly button that poked out from a white t-shirt two sizes too small. With his back to us, Bebo packed his glove in a Nike string bag. He took off his cleats, slipped his hands inside, and clapped the dirt cake spikes together like they were flippers. He threw on a pair of warm black slides, hooked the bag over his shoulders, then turned and saw us. What you got planned tonight? And this asked before Babel had a chance to breathe. Can we come through? I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Jared. And I'm sorry that I mispronounced the title of the story. It's Bebo, not Bebo. But I'm going to turn it over to, uh, oh no, we've got Willa next. Right, sorry, I get to introduce Willa. Um, OK, thank you so much, Jared. Now I will introduce our second fiction reader tonight. Willa C. Richards is a graduate of the Iowa Writers Workshop, where she was a Truman Capote Fellow. Her, his, her work has appeared in the Paris Review, and she is a recipient, recipient of the Penn Robert J. Dow Story Prize for Emerging Writers. She's the author of the novel, The Comfort of Monsters, which was published by Harper Collins in 2021. And one thing that I think is really amazing that I just found out recently is that the C in her name is for Cather because she is named after the great Willa Cather. So she was destined to become a writer, I think. Anyway, Willa, we're so happy to have you here reading from the story that's in this issue. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Elliot and everyone at the Kenyon Review for having me tonight. Um, it's just really an honor to be published in this issue um, and uh, really excited to be reading with all these other lovely contributors. Um, and yeah, this story is is really special to me. Um, I started it, I think, seven years ago, um, which is kind of uh, scary to, to say out loud, but, um, and I wrote it during a really tough time in my life. So it's really, really special to, to see it um, in print and to be able to read from it tonight. Um, so yeah, I'm just like Jared, I'm just going to read a little bit from the, from the beginning. Um, and uh, yeah. So this is uh, what can't be grown must be mined. The first job Annie took after the abortion was the most dangerous one she could find on shovelbums.org. According to the listing, there was a slight possibility she could be blown to bits on this job site in Missouri. Though this was not how the US government had phrased it. Undoubtedly, this risk, however slight, was a deterrent for most archeological field texts, especially the greener ones. But for Annie, this possibility was reassuring, maybe even welcome. She believed she deserved an explosive death. Plus, mercifully, if she did die, she would never have to see Walker again. Annie planned to go to Missouri alone with the hopes that when she returned to her dismal one-bedroom apartment in Milwaukee, her boyfriend Walker and his things would be gone. Walker's plan to repair their relationship seemed to be to smother Annie with his presence, to fill her life up so completely with his smell, his music, his booze, his terrible but impassioned cooking, his tools, and above all else, his emotional recklessness, that she would eventually give in to his ubiquity and be forced to admit her life would be empty and pointless without him. But the more he tried to fill her life up and her apartment, the more she began to shrink from him until she decided she needed to leave Milwaukee altogether. Unfortunately, she'd made the mistake of leaving the job application open on her computer. And so Walker also had applied. At first, Annie was angry because she assumed he would get the job instead of her. He had at least a dozen of years of experience on her three. But when they both received offers, she was even angrier. She wanted to hurt him, but she felt incapable of it. Instead, she begged him to take a different job. He was defensive and hurt. I got to make a living too, Anne, he said. He was sharpening his trowel with a file. He was going at it with ritualistic fervor. Soft metal shavings fell on her kitchen floor. She knew he would not clean them up. Last week, he had agreed to move out once he got a job. Now he was moving with her to a job she'd found. She didn't know how to shake him, 
She blamed herself because she'd been weak after she tried to break up with him, letting him stay until he got a job, letting him sleep in bed with her, letting him rub and kiss her feet when they hurt. She knew it was her fault. Even her own sister had said, Anne, you're sending mixed messages. What do you expect? You could get a job anywhere in this damn country, she said. Not for that kind of money. She supposed he might be right about that. The project was offering an unusually high hourly, partly because of the potential for risk and partly because of the employer's knowledge that most shovel bums like Annie and Walker were uninsured. I wanna go alone, she said. He nodded. I understand. We'll drive down together, but it'll be like you don't even know me. He winked. She felt shame bubbling in her throat, the way hydrogen peroxide fizzes inside an ear. It was dissolving her. We are not together, Annie said to him. He shrugged like, okay, we are not together. She repeated this often, like a mantra, sometimes just to herself when he loomed too large in her mind, or when, like he would be that night, after they stopped arguing, he was inside her. At a gas station in Illinois, where heat rose from asphalt in great shining waves, Annie caught the eye of a woman as she hefted a sleeping sweat-gloss baby from her car and carried him inside. Annie felt something drop inside of her. She waited for it to shatter. She clutched herself and watched the woman with the baby reappear, but Walker came back before her. He tossed licorice ropes and bags of pork rinds through the car window. They landed in Annie's lap on the car floor in Walker's seat. She crushed a bag of rinds beneath her boots. Walker put the key in the ignition and the engine turned over and coughed in the thick, muddy heat. He threw the stick into an unforgiving first and they squealed out of the parking lot. He was hard on that Cherokee. He was hard on everything he loved. Annie twisted her neck, hoping for another glimpse of the woman with the baby, but the heat blurred the buildings and the side mirrors into shining shapes. Walker ripped a bag of rinds open with his teeth. He offered the bag to Annie, but she shook her head. It was beginning to get dark, but the heaviness of the heat seemed capable of keeping the night at bay forever. She was tired already, and they still had at least 400 miles before they got to the job site. Let's get a motel room tonight, she said. Walker chewed on a rind. Nah, we'll be good. I want a shower. What's the point? We got work tomorrow anyway, he said. Here. He handed her a licorice rope, but she tossed it away. She was hungry for something green. In the end, they drove through the night just like Walker wanted. The world outside was a blur of the Mississippi's black banks, cornfields so dense Annie could discern no rows, and neon gashes of gas station lights. Walker had popped too much speed back at the gas station. His kneecaps trembled beneath the steering wheel. They didn't stop, and though she never fell asleep, Annie felt as though they were moving through a dream world where time sped up or slowed down at the will of some higher being. The next morning, Annie stood in front of barbed wire. Yellow signs displayed a lightning bolt striking the chest of a prone stick figure. Behind the fence, a brown overgrown field was sunk in fog. The field had once been cleared, maybe plowed, but Annie figured the overgrowth was decades old at least. Walker hung, by his, hung his hands on the fence and pretended it had shocked him. His mop of dark hair swung wildly over his eyes. Annie had an image of a man in an electric chair. Walker peered through his hair to see if Annie had cracked a smile, but finding her lips straight, he stopped. He put his head against the fence. What fresh hell is this, he asked. Beyond a dense line of plantation pines, Annie heard the faint but unmistakable sound of an explosion. The year Annie got pregnant, they were living out of Walker's Cherokee and chasing archeological survey jobs up and down the Mississippi. It was their third year on the road together. They'd met on a project in Montana. He had courted her with a confidence that was embarrassing. They slept together after work one night and Walker had said he would marry her the very next day. He hadn't, but he had loved her with a singularity that was appealing to Annie. He took care of her on the road and watched out for her on the job. He listened to the long winding stories of her childhood. He worshiped every part of her body and spent focused minutes massaging her calves. In bed, he was a good unselfish lover. He didn't tire easily or become bored with going down on her the way other men did. And he had a magnetism that drew Annie to him automatically and without thinking. Machine-like almost, she found herself drifting toward him in an open room. She wasn't the only one. Walker was the type to hold court in a bar or at a dinner table, telling elaborate stories with far-fetched details that were easily and happily forgiven. In another lifetime, she thought he could have been an actor or a politician. He was the type of person you could imagine might lead a thousand different lives. It was the possibility of these lives that alternately thrilled and horrified her. She loved the messy routines of their work, long days in the sun, in cord fields stretching for acres, on construction sites, peeling off her dirt crusted clothes, nights in small town laundromats, seedy motel after seedy motel, scrubbing soil from his jaw in the shower. 
She knew it was not a life she could sustain indefinitely, but it hadn't yet tipped into anything she couldn't handle. But then Annie had accidentally skipped a few birth control pills and after peeing on a stick in a gas station bathroom, realized she was pregnant. She was 24. She had absolutely no idea how Walker would respond to this news. Each possibility seemed probable, excited, elated, disappointed, frightened, angry. Every day she meant to tell him and every day she held her tongue until she made the appointment without telling anyone. And when it was done, she was certain of almost nothing. For several weeks after the procedure, she woke up every morning and was horrified to discover she was still bleeding. Walker did not notice, or maybe he thought she was having a bad period. He didn't mention anything. He didn't ask. She volunteered nothing. Soon she became consumed with hateful thoughts, first about herself and then about Walker, who, unlike her, continued to move through the world unaffected, ignorant, still happy to count their combined savings from the summer gigs, search for jobs, order Chinese food draw her scalding baths and fuck her while her feet were still hot and pink from the bath water. His happiness enraged her. She knew she should tell him what she'd done, but the further away the abortion became, the more she hoped she could forget it. The thought also occurred to her that if she told him, he might become sad or sympathetic and she could no longer hate him for not knowing. She felt she needed this hate to live. The problem was though, her hate for Walker was filtered through her feelings about herself, what she and she alone had done and mixed in with a dangerous, unpredictable lust a kind of want that felt explosive. And she could not have predicted when she did try to break up with him that he would not leave. And this not leaving would confuse her to the point of paralysis. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for that reading, Willa. Um, I'm gonna introduce her our next and our last poet of, of the evening, Brian Stevenson, um, who has a new book coming out. Um, so it's really exciting to be able to, to introduce her poems um, through, through KR and knowing that this book is coming out in the world, please find it. Um, Brian Stevenson's first book, Human Resources, is the winner of the 2021 Max Ritvo Poetry Prize, selected by Henri Cole. It is, forthcoming from Milkweed Editions in June 2022, but I'm sure you can get on that pre-sale. Uh, her work has appeared or is forthcoming in the Adroit Journal, Bennington Review, Columbia Poetry Review, the Cortland Review, Denver Quarter Quarterly, and Kenyon Review, among others. She lives in Oakland, California. Please welcome Ryan. Thanks so much, Christina. Can you guys hear me all right? Yeah, okay. Um, thanks so much, Christina, and everyone who helped put together this issue and this reading tonight. I am so thrilled to be part of this issue and very honored to be in the company of such talented writers as, as I'm reading with this evening. Um, the poems that I am reading tonight from the issue are from the book that's coming out this June called Human Resources. And I will start with um, the title poem of the book, Human Resources. I spend all day trying to break a female bot who wants to coach me to be my best self. Time to figure out dinner again. Time to plug in my phone for the third time today. On my way to the store, my car plays me a voice message from my grandmother. For Christmas, she wants a pet robot she heard about on the radio, a life-sized adult cat that purrs when rubbed in the right places. She thinks I create these creatures, but it's God who creates them. I hear a clock tick. I listen for the food to tell me it's time. You ask me if I'm sure after I say I'm okay, after you ask me if I'm okay, knowing you said something hurtful. On the kitchen counter, a faded splash of orange where battery acid spilled from our emergency flashlight. I return to it each day with a magic eraser. Something about the way the Ferrante translation uses the word suffer. I want to go back and change my answer. When I lie down, the workday is still going in my head. And of course you'll want a female bot. That's what everyone wants. The best part is you can change her clothes with the seasons. I dream about the department that women are reassigned to after they file harassment complaints. 
I dream this because it happened. Under a drop ceiling, each woman has her own fax machine to do her pretend work. Messages scribbled on lightweight paper and sent to nowhere. I don't get to see the words, but know what they say. The Valley. We want them to look and act human, but not too real. Get it? My boss said, touching the dip in a lion graph, the uncanny valley. We worked on his boat. He said that made our company a ship and him our captain. In an interview about gender bias and AI, I overheard him say he was proud to have built his ship out of women. I understood those women to be me. He'd often tell me he wanted my honest opinions, but it was my company too. Honesty was something that set him apart as he had nothing to hide. This, I suppose, should have made it my privilege when he told me the glass ceiling was high, but it was there. When he wanted to talk vision, we'd walk the path along the water to a dock that sticks out into the bay. Every time we got to the end, he'd look down and say the same thing. It's not as deep as you'd think, just so dark you could drop in anything and it would disappear. Fatigue. I come home to announce my second fender bender in six months. Where is it I go, my husband wants to know. On the TV, a man says women are just like skyscrapers. Next thing I know, I am one. And so is Jan from across the street and Lynn and Pam too. It's just like he said. We look down at our husbands who stare at each other from the restful windows of the houses we used to live in. None of them leave all day or for days after. Jobs quickly disappear and therefore the news, and therefore the war. Someone tries to call a meeting, but the phone tree is dead. I hear them plan. Soon they'll move out of their houses and into us. They'll carry mattresses and tables on their backs, up our utility stairs, make new homes and offices. Anyone seen the stapler? Someone says every hour or so. Nights they toss, make lists, Check the kids only to find them talking to the dark. Months pass or years, the cottony gauze hangs over their world. Car keys disappear. At the grocery store, floating numbers and percentage signs. Seasons return, children become ghosts and adults. Fluoride climbs to popularity, then drops back down. Wake up, you're asleep. How could you be so tired? At any point in the day, they might walk into a room or open the refrigerator and just look around. There's always something they can't put their fingers on. Thank you. Thank you all. What a what a rich reading and what a what a fantastic. Um, the display of the variety of um, ways you can take the the, the work uh, idea in, in your own work. Um, thank you. Uh, we are now entering our Q&A section. And uh, initially, we're going to start with Elliot and Christina asking some questions to the readers. But I want you all in the audience to be thinking of questions you have. And if you'd like to put them in the chat, we will ask them for you. Uh, if you'd like to put in the chat, I have a question, then uh, we will call on you and you can ask it audibly yourself. Um, but please do be thinking of questions um, and submitting them as we begin the Q&A. And I will let Elliot get us started. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you for those wonderful readings. I also wanted to say I can see in the participant list that some of the other contributors to this issue are here. Um, we love you all. We love your work. Thank you. I, I think I see Daniel J. O'Malley is here. He has a great story called The Allens in this issue. Um, Annalisa Bolin, I hope I'm pronouncing your surname correctly, uh, has an essay called um, Like Dogs. And Angela Woodward, who 
who I see um, has this incredible novel. I can't wait to read the whole thing called Ink. I just put a link so you can all pre-order it if you want, but there's a really brilliant excerpt of Ink in this issue. So again, buy the issue if you don't already have it. Um, I'm gonna start, I have a question for you, Willa. Um, I, I, when I read this story, I was fascinated because I didn't know anything about shovelbums.org. At first I thought you'd made it up. And then after I read the story, I you know, went to the website and realized it was a real thing. Um, so I understand it's a kind of a site for essentially freelance archeologists, but I'm curious, you know, you're a writer, not an archeologist. Um, what sort of uh, research went into this story or, you know, where the idea for this story came from? Yeah, um, well, it's it's very personal. So both of my parents are archaeologists um, and I, you know, grew up, um, you know, visiting sites with them. Um, and then when I was a little bit older, I also worked for both of them um, on various projects. So um, and I took a field school when I was at UW-Madison as well. So I sort of, you know, when I was younger, I was very like kind of bored by what they did and, and you know, not super interested. And then as I got older, I took the field school um, and got really invested in, in their work and um, sort of learned all the terminology from them um, and also became very interested in the lifestyle, especially of like freelance archaeologists. And um, I met quite a few of them through the different projects I worked on. Um, and it's just a really fascinating, but also grueling lifestyle um, that a lot of people Did I freeze a little bit? Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> My connection is a little unstable, but um, so I don't know what you missed. <laughs> but we heard you say you were interested in the world of this freelance archaeology and then you froze a little bit, but yeah, and just and just the fact that, you know, the the work that they do is is super interesting, very physically demanding, um, and you know, oftentimes quite grueling because you're you're you know, traveling across the country, um, living out of motels a lot of times. Um and, and like getting to do science, which is awesome, but, um, but a very, a very interesting mashup of um, expertise and, uh, you know, and like physical labor and all of those things. Um, and so I really wanted to, to write a couple of stories about people that um, work in that, in that world. Well, I could, the, there's so much authority of the way the world is rendered on the page that that's why I wanted to ask you how, how you learned so much, because it was very clear reading it that I was like, this is, this person knows what she's talking about. So thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Christina, who has a question for a poet. Yes, a poet. Um, thank you. Uh, and thank you for those readings. Just, it's so lovely to hear them from, from this vantage point. Um, yeah, I, so, you know, when when thinking about this issue, how, how we put it together, but also looking at the poems, hearing the poems by these poets um, who read for us to share their work with us today, Leila and, and Ryan. Um, I think, you know, what was most striking to me was how um, they both seem to be interested in accessing and um, uh, attending to the humanity um, in sort of the barrage of workplaces that um, that we can we can enter as people and that can kind of strip us of our humanity or numb us. Um, and you know I did the very dorky poet thing of, of trying to find the etymology of work to like access some questions. Um, and uh, really it's just it comes from the idea of an action or um, an action performed and especially a physical action. Um, so it got me thinking, Ryan, about your, your poems in particular and um, how it seems that in a lot of, um, in a lot of the lines, uh, there is a choice being made by the speaker to act or not act. Um, and um, even an action performed in the body of, of, of the, the speaker as woman who becomes skyscraper, for example, um, which um, you know, I think is really a wonderful way to access this idea. And I, I wonder if you would speak to that a little bit, the idea of you know, what the speaker is, is acting upon um, or not acting upon and, and what the poet is acting upon or not acting upon in their work. 
Thanks for your question. Um, it's a hard one. <laughs> um, well, I think I think the the skyscraper example that you bring up is an interesting is an interesting one um, for this question when it when it comes to talking about action um, because there's something that's both I think um, empowering and imagining um, and for the for me as the writer there's something that was really empowering about imagining like inhabiting like uh, a, something like a, a skyscraper and becoming a skyscraper um obviously like there's something that's like really um towering <laughs> about the skyscraper um and it like it quite literally like makes the the speaker of the poem leave the domestic space and become um, her own space and her own building. Um, but I think also that I wanted to, like in doing so, I also feel like the speaker um, at the same time, I like wanted to communicate, uh, like even in that, feeling of empowerment uh the speaker is still again like inhabited by um men or the outside world trying to uh find a, a domestic space within her even as a skyscraper so um yeah i'm interested in both uh ways in which uh like action can double back on itself as uh, not having any agency. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I know that I, I'm not sure if I answered your question at all, but um, that's kind of what I was thinking about when I was writing that poem. Uh, the way that kind of the the dichotomy of of action that women often experience in the world. No, he answered it beautifully. And, and I think, you know, the idea of thinking about space in this way too, and, and as a, a kind of um, an answer to, right, an action performed against uh, uh, the ways that um, particularly capitalist forces in your poems are, are constraining um, bodies is, is really wonderful. So thank you. That was a great answer. Thank you um, so much. Yeah, I'll turn it over to you, Elliot. Thanks, Christina. So Jared, I have a question for you. So um, I know that Jared, you are working on a story collection and you mentioned that Bebo is, um, is uh, going to be the first story in the collection. At least that's what you're thinking right now. Um, and one of the things I love is what a strong presence the city of Hartford is in this story. I presume, um, I'm assuming correctly that the whole, the whole collection is set in, Hartford, and um, there's obviously a great tradition of story collections that are linked by place. Obviously, Joyce's Dubliners and Sherwood Anderson's uh, Winesburg, Ohio, and Edward P. Jones's Lost in the City, which is set in my hometown of Washington, D.C. But I wondered if you could talk a little bit, Jared, about you know, the, the, the work of building this collection and also just um, the importance of Hartford as a, as a kind of character in your work. Yes, um, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I'm from Hartford, Connecticut. Um, while I was in my um, MFA, um, I was, you know, bouncing around different stories. And I guess I, I also haven't, I haven't really ever completed a story that I didn't think would be a part of a project, like a conception of a project. I like, you know, like some fun folks can like turn out a story. Um, but I, I, I really had to think about the collection when I, this is, Babo was the first story that I, I finished that I was like, oh, I know, I know what I'm going to do here. Um, and it allowed everything else to open up for me. Um, but it also, you know, I started that story three years ago and some other stories from the collection have um, since come out before then. Um, but, you know, thinking about Hartford, it very much is a character in this, in the story, you know, um, I want to talk about the history of, I try, try to slip in different things about the history of Hartford at the same time, um, you know, and in, in, the, in the sense that 
where I, when the time when I grew up in Hartford, um, you know, there are like gangland episodes about Hartford now, like on the History Channel. And like, that's what you know about it. Um, whereas, um, you know, Mark Twain once said it was the most beautiful city I'd ever seen because there used to be a river that ran through it like Venice. And so I'm trying to think about these kind of things. Um, also dropping these kind of these kind of small details about Hartford. Um, there's a Cedar Hill Cemetery where J.P. Morgan is buried in Catherine Hepburn. Um, you know, I referenced in this in this story um, of um, Frederick Law Olmsted, who did the Central Park, but also did this uh, the, this hospital um, in in Hartford. So I try to I'm trying to piece these things together. I'm, I'm trying to also just talk about the neighborhood um, and and the the characters in there are kind of really representative of that. You know, um, we have Ennis, who's a Bosnian refugee. So we have a, a big Bosnian refugee um, community um, in Hartford specifically. Um, you know, in other stories, I have you know, you're trying to move around different neighborhoods. Um, right now, the, Hartford is primarily Puerto Rican Dominican. Um, so we're gonna go to Frog Hollow and um, and a different story we're talking about there. And with Babo really though, it really was the grounding story um, that I really needed to like, I, that's why I, in my head, it, it, it was, it's the first story. Um, it really needs to be um, also because there's a character that we didn't get to meet called the suit man that's in here. Um, I didn't get to read in the, in the excerpt that is threaded throughout um, the nine stories um, and then he'll finally have his story at the end but um, there are a lot of different characters that are just introduced in the story that will come up later and then it also establishes the neighborhood and things like that and I just wanted to make Hartford feel very vivid and very real and have the history there but also the present day streets and these kind of things as well. So. I'm, I was so happy when you told me that this suit man is a recurring character because I told you when I read even though I've only read a couple of, of the stories I, I read the one that was in the Yale Review and I read this one but um I just had a sense reading this story that the suit man, he just felt important to me. I mean, I told you I was like, he looms large, even though he's kind of minor. And so I'm so excited that he's going to kind of pop up again. Um, because as I said, he's like, a, to me, a kind of very moving representation of um, late capitalism, kind of absurd and moving and heartbreaking. Um, thank you. That's awesome. I guess we're going to open it up. Ocean, do you have a question for our readers? And then we'll open it up to the audience. I, yeah, think Christina, sure. I think Christina has one more. I see her. Oh, I'm getting her attention. I'm sorry, Christina. That's all right. I just want to make sure that I asked. No, no, no. That was my fault. Was, no, no. <laughs> it's all right. We're all we're all just figuring it out. Um, yeah, I, I do have a question for Layla specifically. Um, and really it can apply to both of you. Both of the questions kind of can. Um, but you know, again, because of what I was thinking through in, in reading the the, the work. Um, and this idea of doing the work, right? Like that comes up, I think often, I hear, I hear my poet friends say it quite a lot, um, this idea of doing the work and the effort and tension that happens in, in making a poem. Um, and I was thinking about just how, how um, wonderfully uh, you, you do this in your, in your line work, Layla, um, and throughout your poetry and how um, you, you don't overwork the poem, right? Which is like this fine line um, that I think is is really curious and challenging and exciting for poets. Um, so I wonder, you know, how uh, you do the work of of sort of recognizing and managing that fine line in in your poetry. Thank you. Um, whew, yeah. Well. Certainly on the line level, I'm very interested in, in lines. Um, before, speaking of work, before, uh, before I became a poet full-time, uh, if I can say that, um, before that happened, I was a special education teacher. And um, one of the, the tools we used for students who had dyslexia was to isolate you know, sentences and language. Um, so using like note cards or pieces of paper to really um, zero in on just you know the smallest unit of language to make it easier to process, um, and I I th I think about lines that way. I really try to look at each line and think of it as its own unit. And um, if if a line's not doing anything interesting or strange, uh, and it, that that goes on for maybe like two or three lines, then I know I need to I need to do some work in there because then it gets slack. Um, so I I care a lot about what's happening on that on that small level as I'm writing. Um, and uh, my revision process is maybe a little wonky in that uh, I, I, don't, I don't revise in, in maybe like the, 
draft one, draft two, draft three sort of way. Um, I, I, I think of it kind of like wet concrete where um, when I first start writing, I, uh, I can fiddle within like maybe like a five line range. Um, but once I start to move beyond it, so let's say I get down to like line 10, whatever happened in five and up is done, you know, like it's, it's set. Um, so if I get to the end of this version of the poem and it, it's not working, I don't try and go in and chip away at it. I throw it away and start again. Like I go to, to a new page. I don't copy and paste anything. I just try, try again. Um, and so I think that keeps me honest. I think like if I, I don't know, my particular way of writing, um, if I were to sit and tinker and tinker and tinker, I think I would edit out the like original life that it had. Um, and so I'm keeping track of, you know, some, some choices and things when I, so I, I write kind of slowly actually like my poems um, to work down the way, um, but I'm making a lot of choices along that way. Um, and if I were to go back and rework it, I think, you know, essential threads would be broken or, or, or lost or, you know, by, by not paying attention um, to, you know, what I'd originally come to the page with. Um, and I know for me, I always want a little bit of um, mystery, I guess, um, in a poem. Uh, I know I'm done with a poem when it teaches me something I, had, I didn't know before starting it. Um, and something, uh, you know, it can be as small as, oh, I never thought of that seeing the world that way, like with a metaphor or something, or it can be a big revelation, like, wow, apparently that's how I feel about, you know, <laughs> this major thing. Um, so for me, not having a plan going in, just sort of, you know, showing up to the page and seeing what, what comes, I think allows there to be a little wildness, because um, it's like I'm forging ahead with, <laughs> you know, the machete into the, the wilds of the page. Um, and I, I trust that. So sometimes when there's something that appears that I don't really know fully what it is, um, I've learned to trust to trust that and to know when I'm not, you know, uh, BSing. You know, like I'm not, I don't want to be performing. I don't want to be something that shows up that I don't know because I'm trying to do something for somebody else. It's something that genuinely seems like a, a wisp or something <laughs> came in and showed up and I'm like, oh, okay, I guess you're here. And then I, <laughs> you know, move on. Um, and for me, I, I try to aim for you know, for a little, you know, certainly a, quite a bit of clarity, um, you know, maybe 80%, but I'm, a, I'm fine with a little 20% roughness. And uh, that's what I like to read too. I like a little grit, you know, a little grit in there. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's, yeah, I love that answer. And I love that there's so much play actually in that answer. <laughs> um, yeah, wonderful. I'm, I'm so glad um, that we got to hear you, all of you. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Elizabeth. Yeah, um, thank you all for starting us with the questions. And audience, this is your this is your time if you have a question to let us know that. Um, and I know that Ocean has one, so I will I will um, let Ocean unmute themselves and ask all. Thank you so much for all of your reading. It was really amazing. Um, I want to ask a more general question, I guess. Uh, I guess besides the theme of labor, I feel like a lot of your work have like touched on like self or growing or confusion. And I'm interested in like learning how that affects your revision process or if you want to just talk about revision process in general, it'd be great. I mean, I, I will say at least, um, like since I mentioned this story, it's been about like three years in the making. Um, it's uh, it's gone through a lot of different drafts and versions. And I mean, a lot of the core components were there, but it was really trying to figure out the the ending um, and what I wanted to be on the page, what I didn't want to be on the page. Um, you know, there's a I don't, I don't like, to, I don't know if anyone, like everyone has read the stories. I don't want to say like everything, but um, there, there are ways that it could have been, I guess, more um, graphic on the, on the, on the, on the, on the page um, and seeing some things like go off. And, and so, um, and then really trying to think about the narrator Colin and like, why is he telling the story? I think that was like one of the biggest things, um, you know, at the time when I was working on it, my, I, I was really fortunate that my, um, my workshop professor, um, was was Paul Beatty and we had a conversation about it and and because we have these three these three characters in a room 
um, and they're bouncing around in dialogue so much. Um, it was really thinking about, but why is why is Colin of the person telling this story? Mainly because you have Ennis whose personality is so strong and, 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 and he takes up a lot of space. And then you have Babel who's, who, whose character is strong in its, in its different way, but he's a quieter character and we really wanna know then why is, why is Colin just watching and telling us this story? Um, and so in that, I really had to think through like who Colin is. Um, Cause I had, I had a clear sense of Babo and I had a clear sense of, of Ennis, but it was um, really trying to like extricate and like jot down different things about, about Colin and who he is, who he grew up. Um, and also kind of think about like, where is Colin like now as well? Um, and what happens to Colin like later in life, which is that's like a really another, that's a separate thing about like a novel, <laughs> but we're gonna, but we're going to, uh, but I really had to think these kind of things through to get to the ending to then actually then play with time actually. And actually just let's, let's jump back. And, um, and these are the kind of things that I, I had to like really work through in terms of like my, my revision. Um, and then when I finally, when I finally got it, I, I thought I had it. Um, I was sending it back and forth with my agent and, you know, and, and it was like, uh, it's not quite there. And then when I, when I had it, um, I, I, I carried, I really texted her instead of emailed her. I was like, I think I got it and sent it over. And it was kind of like, yeah, <laughs> it was like, we figured, we figured out what it, what it was. And that was a really, um, a great feeling. But when you know, when I knew it, I knew it. And that's, and that was it. So. I just, Ocean, I just wanted to add one thing to what you were saying, Jared, is that I think sometimes that happens to the fiction that you, it's not that it all has to be on the page, but the author has to have sort of figured out what's going on because there, are, you know, we have a sort of melancholic tone and like a hint of a sense of guilt um, without actually knowing exactly what happened, you know, and I, um, but I can tell that you know what happened. So it's, you know, I, I also appreciate that the story doesn't like tell us exactly what happened to Babel that night and exactly what, but, um, but I feel like you you did enough for us to be like, oh, <laughs> gut punch. Any other writers want to talk about revision and your yourself as well? Sure. I, can, I mean, I can talk a little bit about uh, this story in particular um, and the process, uh, which was a a long one. Um, I, I started it a really long time ago and it was sort of one of those stories that I wrote in like fits and starts, um, which, you know, a lot of some, some of my other stories, I feel like I just kind of bang out and then I do like the revision, you know, bit by bit. Um, and this was a strange story because I sort of started it, then I put it away for a really long time and then I came back to it and, you know, kept working on it. Um, so I didn't really have like a finished draft of it um, for a long time. Um, and so it was a really different writing process than most of my other other stories. Um, I guess it was a little bit more like my novel writing process in that way. Um, and so I think when I sat down to do the revisions of it, um, you know, I, it, it felt like, it, you know, it, it felt more like a novel, like I had been working on it for so long that, um, you know, I sort of had, had lost like the person that I was when I first started it, um, which is, you know, can be, can be really interesting, but it can also be, um, can be a little scary. So, um, yeah, I don't know. It was a, it was a, a much different process with, with this story than some of my other ones. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know, I guess that's, that's all I really have to say about the revision of it. Other questions from the audience? I was just going to build on one thing Willa said, and maybe this will inspire the rest of you that like, it almost sounds like the writing of the story was a kind of archaeology, you know, you're sort of digging and like trying to find the, the thing. But, but I think sometimes when you're writing, like resistance is like a sign that you're onto something, you know, that when it doesn't all come out really easily, it's like, oh, maybe I'm, <laughs> maybe I'm unearthing some like uncomfortable truths that are going to make really good work once I figure it out. Well, I don't want to belabor <laughs> the uh, the evening, but I uh, I just want to thank you all again, um, Ryan and Layla and Willa and Jared for reading with us, and um, Elliot and Christina and Ocean for your help. Uh, and audience, thank you for choosing this to be the thing that you tune into tonight. That is a real gift for us too, and it's great to see so many familiar names, uh, workshop participants, or contributors, or you know Kenyan people. The, the larger KR family. Um, 
thank you for being here. And I'll ask Ocean, if you don't mind putting in the chat some um, opportunities to purchase the issue, which Elliot is holding up. It is lovely and thick. This is a this is a good one. If you're going to get one issue, this is this is the one to get. You can also get a subscription while you're there. Um, and again, we have uh, the um, books written by our authors tonight uh, in, our, in our bookshop, um, the Kenyan Review Bookshop page, which Ocean will uh, put in the chat as well. And keep your eye open. We will be having another issue launch uh, for our May, June issue. Um, so please be checking back about that. Um, and we hope you all have a wonderful night. And again, thank you so much uh, for joining us.